Hi, my name is Shira Rubinoff. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer with Harrisoft. I'm here with the Harrisoft video series, joined by Anthem Blanchard, CEO of Harrisoft, and our guest, Paul DeGraft from SailPoint, the Senior Identity Strategist. Welcome both to our video series. Thanks, Shira, for having us. Thank you, Shira. Pleasure. So, Paul, let me start with you and ask you this uh, very poignant question in the cybersecurity world. Do you believe there's a link between ransomware and identity security? Yeah, there sure is, kind of. Uh, you know, we definitely see attackers these days going after um, identities and accounts of people, and especially people either in high positions like CEOs, CFOs, and really targeting their ransomware towards those kind of people. And what we recently see is more and more with the uh, proliferation of infrastructure as a service and all the, the cloud services around that they're targeting. The DevOps people are now being targeted because they have a lot of permissions and access to resources. So we definitely see that targeting. And uh, for us, that is definitely an area we're pretty focused on. And if you read all the, the reports as well, you see sort of that 60 to 80% of all security incidents are identity related. And then unfortunately, we're just with that is that about 90% of that could actually have been prevented, which is worse, kind of, if you know what I mean, <laughs> kind of, right? When you read that kind of statistic, that's real scary that it could have been prevented. Exactly. You know, identity has been a massive problem, certainly in the cybersecurity world, how to lock it down, how to make sure that it's completely secure. And Anthem, I'd love to hear your take on that question as well. Thank you, Shira. I totally uh, can relate and Literally every day now, it seems like I have a friend or a friend of a colleague that's writing me saying that they have or they know someone that's been victimized by ransomware. And ultimately, I think by removing a lot of the centralization that happens and certainly places where you have uh, many, many, if not all user credentials in a central database, for example, it creates a honeypot literally where bad actors can go and literally steal away all these credentials and just make a total mess of trying to protect lockdown systems. And really by having credentials on the user's edge and removing the credentials from the central databases, this is a technique that we like to use to be able to really secure identity management. And Paul, do you have any interest to discuss around that area. Certainly from your background, you have quite extensive knowledge on that. I'd love to hear how you see it interplaying from Anthem's responses. Sure. No, I definitely think if uh, we can reduce identity. So I think the the move towards more decentralized identity is definitely the way to go. It's just you know, we're still a few years away probably for seeing that in a massive scale, kind of what we see vendors definitely moving in that uh, area where it's particularly around privacy and consent management, right? So really putting the the end user in control. So whether that's from a consumer perspective or from an enterprise perspective, but, you know, you will see more and more and also probably driven by legislation no doubt worldwide that the consumer or me as an employee will get more control over my data and that's ultimately where we need to be kind of it just it, it flips the whole uh, scenario upside down kind of uh, right on how we traditionally have done with data kind of and we need to put it back in control of the user kind of uh, but that will take some time no doubt you know, I, I, of course you know i couldn't agree more i think that's a very important way that the, the ecosystem needs to move and is is moving today and will be widely adopted as time goes on so Anthem, what can organizations do to understand their attack surface from an access perspective? Well, first, I think it's important to look outside of yourself, look to third parties that can provide assessments, audits, penetration tests, you know, really, you know, maybe even more than one, just to make sure you minimize the biases. And then once you really take a look, you know, then I think it's about what to do next. And of course, from our standpoint, we always like to advocate a distributed model away from a centralized model and to take a very small incremental approach. And that really means doing a little bit and then layering on everything else that already exists. So that way it's an additive as opposed to removing and a subtractive. So, you know, really um, we look at it as, you know, a march toward a distributed model and eliminating the central points of failure. Paul, what would you say 
that organizations need to do in terms of understanding where Anthem's perspective is coming from? Does yours um, align with that in some ways? And how is it a broader scope from your vision mm -hmm. as well? Yeah, so coming back to sort of maybe the first point even uh, on that is sort of, you know, back in the day, we, everybody was focused on sort of patching. That was the thing. Nobody was patching effectively and a lot of people could break into systems because people weren't putting what we may call IT hygiene in place to sort of make sure. Cyber hygiene. <laughs> cyber hygiene, right? One of my uh, words, yeah. In that respect. But uh, so what we see on the identity side is sort of, I would nearly call it cyber hygiene too, is that basic what we call lifecycle management processes are not implemented. So that's onboarding, offboarding. We see so often as we do our implementations of our solutions that, you know, people have no idea who accounts belong to, whether that's a third party or, you know, some machine that may have access to critical resources, right? So what we really try to do is give people that visibility and that control over who has access to what and really understanding you know, that, you know, should this person actually have access to this, right? And, and put some governance and guardrails around that so that uh, we can provide that kind of visibility to people, which is critical these days because with the proliferation of cloud and, you know, so much data that's out there to really bring that all into one view is, uh, is really what our customers are looking for. So we're really happy to provide those kind of capabilities and really giving people that kind of visibility. So, so it reduces the attack service, right, kind of, because we will remove access from places where people don't need it. Um, so really bringing that down uh, is, a, is a big step for us and our customers love us for it. Well, that's critical and, and very much needed. So of course, you know, that is definitely a way to go. And Anthem, in terms of access, can you add to that, please, in terms of how you view access should be adopted or not adopted? Like certainly that is top of mind for organizations, access, zero trust, identity, um, who can, who should, who would. Uh, reducing the surface uh, of, of, of gradients of it, all very, very key. Where do you think that is going and how do you believe that should start moving? Just like Paul mentioned, really on a need to use basis is really the first question. And then once you really look there, I think then it's how centralized are all the applications and all the credentials associated because it's really an efficiency, uh, you know, cost efficiency, um, time efficiency versus security issue right now. And a lot of times if you bundle things centrally, whereas you might get efficiencies for time and cost, you might then create a lot more vulnerabilities because you now give access in one central location to a lot more applications and associated data. So um, I, I think it's definitely a multi-pronged approach and I think it's definitely an incremental approach. You have to really think forensically and, and really try to understand each level as best you can because um, bad actors will go out of their way to try to um, make it difficult to be caught typically. So um, really an incremental approach is the best because that's usually where you find the details, where you find the vulnerabilities, and then you can address the vulnerabilities. Sure. Yeah, yeah. You see some movement towards new technologies or new capabilities like just-in-time access. And I think Gardner calls it zero standing privileges, kind of, or ZSP, where they basically say, you know, don't by default give people access, but give it when they need it, kind of, right? So yeah. when you look at access control lists, kind of, nobody has access, but it's, it's at the time that people need it. So it's far more event-driven, if you will, or at the time that people need access, which reduces your attack service as well, but that's a quite a different concept that we traditionally have been working under. So that will take some time to adopt, especially also from an audit and regulatory perspective who are used to seeing people, okay, give me a list of people that have access and now you will see nobody. That's already, uh, that's data driven, right? Like who has access to that list? Who has access to letting people in? Got to protect your data, right? So now you won't see anybody, right? So it, it sort of moves more to what we may call a more policy-based approach and that auditors sort of need to shift or and regulatory people to sort of how are your policies established and how are those how are those working effectively kind of uh, and that will definitely reduce the attack surface because you know it's not obvious anymore who definitely has access if you will. certainly and and Paul what can organizations do to improve their identity security as a whole 
Well, I think, um, you know, get rid of passwords, right? Passwords have been around for so long. We've been talking about it for a long time, but I think there is a lot. Wait a sec. You got to put a, you should take down the post-its of your ABC123 on your computer. Yeah. something it's not secure. <laughs> you know, it, You'd it, be really surprised. Crazy. I've seen it. <laughs> oh, I, I definitely do see that too. Kind of, uh, if you, I remember at a prior company, we implemented actually a passwordless solution. And especially the executives loved it, kind of, you know, not having to remember a password because they use all these mobile technologies and they're not sitting behind a computer necessarily every day, but they do it on their phone or the tablet. So having passwordless capabilities is just wonderful. It takes away uh, the need for that. So there's more and more technologies coming to help to reduce the the, the storage of passwords, um, if you will say that's a great one uh, to do. The other thing I think we'll see more and more adoption of artificial intelligence and machine learning coming into the identity world to really look at, you know, determining who are the outliers from an access perspective, right? Because in most organizations, there's definitely those that have been around for a long time. People accumulate access, kind of, uh, if you will, to, so to really see you know, who has access to what is that thing? Why not use capabilities like AI and ML to do that? Uh, so that will reduce because the volume of access that people have and the volume of data and everything along with it, there's no human possibility to do that. You know, you can't create reports anymore to do that. It's just <laughs> near impossible kind of. So, uh, so those capabilities will definitely help a lot kind of. So I think people, as they start adopting these kind of technologies, will see tremendous benefit coming back. Excellent. No, sure. And, and Anthem, how would you like to add to that? I, I think that, you know, it's really a suit. I, I think ultimately any way that you can remove personal information, usernames, passwords from centralization is important. You know, we like to refer to a concept called zero knowledge proof, where you can prove something happened. You can prove the authority, for example, or authentication, for example, yet without having to compromise the metadata, the personal data. And then you can combine things like biometrics, you know, reading the live pulse from someone's hand, for example, but eliminate any trail basically going to and from a system to again, like Paul was alluding to and mentioning, to remove really the attack vector because people, the bad actors, don't really know who to attack because they don't have this metadata personal trail going back and forth from some sort of centralized cloud system to the end user. Oh, interesting. Um, any last words either you'd, you'd like to share with our audience, certainly on this topic? Uh, Paul, I'll go to you first, please. Sure. Uh, the last thing probably that, um, you know, is, is on all of our minds as we get back to the office, if you will. Back to the <laughs> office. Hopefully when we get this <laughs> pandemic behind us, um, yeah. one of the things that, that we definitely seen in our customer uh, world and, and the problems that we hear from prospects is that, you know, during the pandemic, people have been so focused on enabling access, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the adoption of cloud services and everything else that goes along with that. Kind of so people probably have over provisioned because it was all about enable, 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 enable. Yeah. But now people realize maybe what they have given access to and need to sort of take a step back. So what we see from our prospects and our customers is that they're like, hey, yeah. we may have overstepped that boundary a little bit and gave yes. people more access than they needed. So so what you will see in this sort of post-pandemic is probably that people will start scratching their heads together again. <laughs> and how do we get this under control uh, again? So we we definitely uh want to emphasize that uh, yes it was nice to do that enablement and that was necessary during the the pandemic um if you will but now it's like okay let's get this back under control again kind of no very good points and anthem what would you like to leave our audience with on this topic as well um you know just to remember that our world requires software to exist and if we can't rely on our software to be up, then we're paralyzed to receive goods and services or to provide goods and services to others, which is the backbone of our society. So really to look to trust now, I think is a wonderful opportunity because it is so topical. We are remote, we are thinking more remotely, we are thinking differently. So I think it's a wonderful time to embrace the evolution into secure computing. And ultimately that means that we can have more reliability on our systems and more trust because they're distributed. 
and we have less reliability on third parties that act as administrators of trusts that ultimately are these weak points that get focused on for a denial of service attack or get focused on for a locker attack, for example. And so um, just really excited about the future. And I think, you know, public protocols, of course, is how our platform um, derives its strength from and being 100% uptime and ransomware proof and perfect data integrity. And I'm humbled and honored um, to be able to have conversations with incredible providers of commerce today. And we're just here to help provide that trust layer and help them be a little bit better, hopefully. So um, just honored and, and grateful for the conversation. Well, terrific. Well, thank you, Anthem and Paul, for joining us today here on the Harrisoft Video Series. Uh, very much appreciate your perspectives, and I'm sure our audience will be very happy to really gain the knowledge from two experts in the field. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate it.